The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 11190 in the name of Kevin Stewart on Hepatitis C. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak could press the Request to Speak buttons now, please. I call on Kevin Stewart to open the debate seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am pleased that uh, Parliament has the opportunity today to debate episode hepatitis C and I'd like to thank all of the members who signed the motion uh, and has made this possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Hepatitis C Trust, Hepatitis Scotland, HIV Scotland and AbV for providing briefings for this debate. Scotland has been hailed as a world leader in tackling hepatitis C uh, and we have been really successful in, in tackling the virus and we must recognise the work of successive Scottish governments of various political hues for their handling of the issue. However, we know that nearly 40,000 people in Scotland are infected with hepatitis C virus, a blood-borne virus that can cause fatal liver damage and cancer if it's left untreated. We know that about 45% of folk with hep C in Scotland remain undiagnosed, and that only about 3% of those with the virus receive treatment each year. We know that hepatitis C affects people from our poor communities much more than those from richer erts and perts, with some 75% of sufferers coming from the lowest two socio-economic quintiles. A recent Hepatitis Scotland and HIV Scotland report found that welfare changes had resulted in 58% of people surveyed with hepatitis C and HIV experiencing poorer mental health, 48% suffering poorer physical health, 45% struggle to pay fuel bills, and 39% struggle to buy food. But enough of the statistics. I want to talk about real people. And I'm great, grateful to the Hepatitis C Trust <coughs> for providing me with some folk's stories. Um, Nigel's story um, is that he had a blood transfusion uh, while he was a cameraman um, in Afghanistan. That blood transfusion uh, saved his life some 13 years ago, but during the transfusion, Nigel contracted hepatitis C. <coughs> he says, before I was diagnosed, I had no idea of the stigma which surrounds hepatitis C, but it leaves you feeling alone and fearful. I got a mixed reception from people when I told them. Some were calm and cool about it, while others were quite put out, to say the least. One of the best things that happened to me was meeting someone else who, had to who told me that they had it too. Suddenly I knew someone else in the same position in me, as me, and that helped. The treatment was gruelling, uh, although I know it affects people differently. For me, it took a lot out of me, both mentally and physically. I had severe depression and had terrible skin rashes, nausea and aching. I did feel quite ill at certain points, but I believe it was all worth it because I feel so much better now. Petra says, I was diagnosed with hepatitis C in 1991. I believe that I contracted it in my 20s when taking drugs through the sharing of needles. When I was diagnosed, not much was known about the virus, and so I didn't seek any treatment. It wasn't until 2003 that I began experiencing problems, including a lack of concentration and an inability to learn new tasks at work. I was diagnosed with chronic hepatitis C infection in 2004, and although my liver was not yet severely damaged, I was keen to rid my body of the virus and prevent myself from constantly worrying about infecting others. I began 24 weeks of treatment, which unfortunately was not successful, something which left me shattered and depressed. I underwent a 48-week course of treatment in 2011 and thankfully successfully cleared the virus. Since being cured of hepatitis C, 
I have dedicated myself to helping people in Scotland with the virus through working with the Hep C Trust and various patient organisations such as the National Parents Forum. I still though suffer the after effects of two courses of interferon based treatment. My hope is that with the new treatments now becoming available, we can move away from interferon based therapies diagnose and treat all those in Scotland with the virus and ensure that Scotland is the first country in the world to eliminate hepatitis C. Mark says, I find it hard to live with hepatitis C for lots of reasons. Know that my risk of getting cirrhosis, liver cancer and a list of other life-threatening conditions goes up every day. The clock is ticking. I also live with reduced energy and sometimes hit a wall where I just plain run out of gas. The brain fog is another difficult symptom of hepatitis C, with loss of concentration, focus and memory, and a tendency towards depression and low moods. I feel a reduced ability to cope with stress, and I live with the knowledge that I could infect someone else. I'm a reservoir for a fast mutating virus, and I could hurt someone. These are some of the stories of people uh, presiding officer and I said at the very beginning that we have a, a, a fairly good international reputation here in Scotland for dealing with Hep C. In order to maintain our international reputation uh, the revised sexual health and bloodborne virus framework which is being published this summer must be as ambitious as possible ensuring access to new treatments and explicitly committing to the elimination of the virus as a serious public health concern. To do this, we must also educate and make the public aware of hepatitis C in order to reduce and eliminate newly acquired infections. We must ensure that we diagnose all of those living with hep C and ensure that they are treated promptly. I believe that the World <laughs> Hepatitis Alliance Summit is being held in Glasgow this September, offering the Scottish Government the perfect opportunity uh, to highlight its world leading efforts and to showcase their highly ambitious plans for addressing hepatitis C, uh, which will hopefully be contained within that revised sexual health and bloodborne virus framework. Presiding officer, hepatitis C is preventable, treatable and curable. Let's make sure that we do all that we can to eradicate the virus from Scotland and export our good practice globally. And hopefully we will soon see a hepatitis C free world. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. And I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Colin Keir. I would like to congratulate uh, Kevin Stewart for bringing forward this important uh, motion. Uh, he's quite right, I think, to uh, praise the current government for the work that they've done on hepatitis C, but he generously refers to the previous uh, administration as well, because I think there has been a lot of continuity. I think uh, right from the start of the Parliament, we had the SNAP uh, report, Scottish Needs Assessment Programme report of 2000, and that led in due course to the two action plans and then to the uh, sexual health and bloodborne virus uh, strategy and we're going to have another iteration of that uh, very uh, soon. So I think there has been a continuity and um, I noticed the hepatitis C uh, section of the uh, framework, uh, the first sentence actually quoted me so it's not often <laughs> I get a chance to uh, quote myself uh, but I said then in 2004 hepatitis C is one of the most serious and significant public health issues of our generation and I think that is still true but there has been a lot of progress since then and one of the issues of course has been the development of the new drugs which Kevin Stewart uh, referred to because a lot of people uh, and I'm sure we've all spoken over the years to people having treatment have, have, have uh, uh, complained about the, the side effects and after effects in fact of interferon based therapy so we have to welcome the new treatments I mean there is an issue obviously they are extremely expensive and I, I know uh, this is an issue for Lothian in general their acute medicine budget has increased by 15 percent in the last year and I don't know what percentage of that is to do with hepatitis C, but there are significant costs there. So I'm certainly not arguing for those drugs to be discontinued, but there may be a case for the cost of acute medicines to be taken more into account in terms of the distribution formula uh, for health board budgets. I give me. 
Kevin Chisholm. Uh, would Mr Chisholm agree with me that sometimes in terms of health e economics, we don't take in uh, the full account of the difference that that treatment will actually make yeah, and the yeah. fact that it will give people the ability to go back and to work and be less reliant on benefit. Uh, and we should take a joined up approach uh, and hopefully the UK government can help in this regard to take a joint up approach to actually deal with these serious illnesses. Because in actuality, it may well be, and it will well be, uh, that, that uh, the cost of treatment um, is, is minuscule compared to uh, the uh, economic uh, uh, situation that can be brought out of treating people. Sure. Malcolm Chisholm, I'll give uh, you Kevin, your time back. Uh, Kevin uh, Stewart certainly makes an important point there. Now, he also, of course, has given us some of the st statistics, which are still quite alarming, because it's not just the overall numbers of nearly 40,000 with chronic hepatitis C, but half being uh, undiagnosed is obviously a matter of concern. And also, we're told uh, of those diagnosed, 75 per cent are not in specialist care. So there are still big challenges, but as, uh, I've, uh, as Kevin Stewart and I have emphasised, there's been great progress, I think, around prevention, uh, diagnosis, notwithstanding the challenges, uh, around uh, developing optimal treatments, around care uh, and uh, support. So that was they were the kind of themes of the action plans, and there's a good emphasis, I think, in the, in the framework on the, the strong inequalities, health inequalities dimension, and also stigma. So those are two very important, relatively new uh, um, priorities flagged up in the, in the framework. And with Elaine Murray uh, sitting beside me, of course, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of the excellent work uh, in relation to health inequalities in Dumfries Prison by the Nursing at the Edge initiative, which focuses on people in prison with hepatitis C in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Now, of course, very many uh, of those um, with hepatitis C have contracted it through injecting with drugs, which is why a lot of the prevention activity is around that. But we, but we can't forget in this debate the several hundred who uh, contracted it from uh, blood uh, products. And that whole issue was of great concern in the early years uh, of the Parliament. Uh, and it led, in fact, to uh, ex gratia payments, uh, which were started by the Scottish Parliament, copied by the UK Parliament. But clearly, we all know the Penrose inquiry is going to report in March, so we must be mindful of the issues of that very complex um, uh, situation, and we all look forward to reading the conclusions of that report. But I, I believe it will also uh, lead to demands for further payments. Certainly, I have constituents of mine still contacting me uh, about that. So I think we mustn't forget uh, those uh, still large number of people who contracted hepatitis C in that way, and we must uh, do all that we can to meet their specific needs and circumstances. Thank you. I now call Colin Keir to be followed by Anne McTaggart. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I add my congratulations to my colleague Kevin Stewart for uh, bringing forward this motion, and uh, I certainly support the principles laid in it. Hepatitis C has presented a major challenge to our health services over many years, and there's no doubt that it still remains a major challenge but there is light at the end of the tunnel in terms of possible treatment. So when doing a bit of research for this evening's debate, I was going through the endless statistics and reports, wondering where to go with the speech. And Kevin Stewart gave some excellent personal examples of um, the problems uh, that are faced by sufferers. And it happened to be on Monday evening, I met an acquaintance I hadn't seen from my school days. And um, we didn't know he's not living in Scotland anymore, it's down in England. And um, as we carried on our general pleasantries, talking about what we were doing, he was quite surprised to find that I'd found myself here. And I happened to mention I was taking part in this debate. And he went a bit quiet on me and uh, sort of said, well, look, I actually, I've been diagnosed with this and it was uh, a wee bit of time ago. And, you know, it, we, we carried on the conversation, as you can imagine. You know, it's, he felt a bit uneasy about it. Um, he didn't explain how or where he contracted the virus, but he was clearly excited by the advance in the drugs, which may help him in coming years. And after a period of time, in talking in very general terms, he started to open up, explaining how difficult it was to explain to his family how he was infected, and it's absolutely clear there were stresses within the family when this happened. The long-term fears were hitting him, how it was going to affect him, what was the effect going to be in developing relationships in the future. 
all these things. People, I have to say, not just involved, uh, who suffer from hepatitis C, but other uh, afflictions as well. He then went through a period where his concern was replaced by anger, interspersed with periods of depression. And that's why I, I see many sufferers uh, seem to go through this uh, state uh, of anxiety, obviously more than anxiety. He joined a support group in the Midlands of England where he eventually managed to get himself in some degree of order. And thankfully he's in a stronger state of mind now than he was not all that long ago. So assuming that most people go through this, we can see why groups such as Waverley Care here in Edinburgh are so important within our communities. Outreach work has been vital, getting out into the communities and dealing with the groups who are at a higher risk of infection. Getting people to talk and for those diagnosed, making sure that help is available. Of course, this description is, I've given is oversimplistic. Some people lead chaotic lifestyles. Maybe they're not clear or know they are suffering from hepatitis C. There's also the issue of dealing with those who are within the prison system or those who are continuing to be hooked on drugs, which bring additional pressure with regards to the practical difficulties surrounding treatment. I pay tribute not just to the present Scottish Government and their efforts, but also to the previous Scottish Government, including Malcolm Chisholm, for the work that they've done. And I was delighted to hear his contribution, which is helpful as ever. The Scottish Government, uh, I, I see, has uh, provided something in the region of 28.7 million funding each year for, uh, towards the sexual health and blood-borne virus framework since 2011. Um, I believe that was a... Uh, to an answer from Jackson Carlaw that that came from, and with around 14.5 million allocated annually to support activities on viral hepatitis. But of course, the real shining light comes in the form of a cure. The old regime of interferon-based treatment certainly isn't perfect. New drugs now available and passed for use will give the possibility of ending the scourge of hepatitis C. Time will tell. And with the commitment of the Scottish Government through the New Drugs Fund, this will undoubtedly make a difference in providing the drugs required. And Kevin Stewart's motion raises a, a number of excellent points. I commend Mr Stewart once again for his motion and based on a positive end for something that has caused misery to many. I support this motion. Many thanks. I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, President Officer, and I am pleased to have the opportunity this evening um, to contribute to this debate as he hepatitis C is an ongoing matter which is of great concern to many of my constituents in Glasgow. Therefore, I thank Kevin Stewart on securing the time in the Chamber this evening to discuss this issue. This is a hugely important year, um, just as important as it was um, 20 years ago when I first studied the implications of Hep C through working within the addiction field. This year has the publication of the revised sexual health and bloodborne virus framework, the staging of the World Hepatitis Alliance Summit in Glasgow in September, and the anticipated availability of a host of new treatments that promise cure rates up to 95%. This year is hugely important. Presiding officer, although Scotland has made progress with Hepatitis C Action Plan and the inclusion of hepatitis C virus and the sexual health and bloodborne virus framework, which is internationally acclaimed, I believe there is still more to be done. Recent treatment targets have not been met and further action is required. Unless this action is taken, hep C will remain a significant public health concern and will result in higher rates of liver disease and cancer at a great cost not only to the individuals but to the health service also. As Kevin Stewart mentioned in his speech, it is estimated that 45% of Scottish chronic hep C infections go undiagnosed. Risk of trans transmission remains high and will remain so without concerted action to test and treat those people who are infected. Glasgow has the highest prevalence rate in Scotland for Hep C, with 40% of all diagnosed cases being in the Glasgow and Greater Clyde area. I have recently been contacted by two of my constituents who have haemophilia. 
They have contracted Hep C as a re direct result of being given contaminated blood products by the NHS. And the hep hepatitis C has left them with cirrhosis of the liver. My constituents are concerned that the treatments currently available in the NHS are less successful than some of the treatments available abroad and, as such, believe that all haemophiliacs in this country should be entitled to receive the most effective drugs and treatment, regardless of cost and country in which the, they are administered. The Scottish Government should seek negotiations with the pharmaceutical com com companies regarding the cost of these drugs. My constituents also state that sufferers of haemophilia are unable to secure life insurance because of their medical condition and expected shortened lifespan. And as such, believe that in such circumstances, the Scottish Government should take responsibility for the payment of life insurance policies to offer stability and security to their families after death. I have written a letter to the Cabinet Secretary of Health regarding both of these cases that I'm currently dealing with, and I'm still awaiting her reply. In conclusion, presiding officer, crucially, hepatitis C is preventable, treatable, and curable for the majority of patients. With new, more effective drug treatments soon to be available, hepatitis C can be eliminated in Scotland, provided there is a Scottish Government commitment to do so to prolong the lives such as those ones as my constituents. Thank you. And I now call Nanette Millen to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This discussion about hepatitis C is well-timed, just a few months before the planned renewal of the Scottish Sexual and Bloodborne Virus Framework. And I too congratulate Kevin Stewart for bringing it to the Chamber at this time. I actually think this issue is of such importance that it merits a full parliamentary debate. And I hope the Scottish Government will consider this as it develops its new framework in the next few months. As we know, hepatitis C blights the health of a significant number of people in Scotland, many of them living in deprived communities, and a high proportion of them people who have used or who currently use injected drugs, who are homeless, or who come from countries where the virus is endemic, such as parts of Asia or Eastern Europe. It is of concern, not only that nearly 40,000 people in Scotland are known to be infected by the virus, but that this is little more than half the population thought to be carrying it, who have no idea that they're infected until they develop the signs and symptoms of serious liver disease. The statistics are alarming, with only 28% of chronically infected HCV patients attending a specialist treatment centre in 2013, an almost 240% increase in liver-related deaths in, in the last 15 years among people diagnosed with the virus. And 21% of the 98 liver transplants carried out in Scotland in 2013 at an average cost of £40,000 each, being due to hep C-related liver damage. Worryingly, less than 40% of people confirmed as having the virus have had the, their genotype tested, which is crucial if they're to be given the most appropriate therapy for their condition. And just 3% of Scotland's nearly 5,000 GPs have, have completed level one or two of the RCGP certificate in the detection, diagnosis and management of hepatitis B and C in primary care. There's good news too, however, and as we know, with, the, the, with Scotland recognised as a world leader in the battle against hep C through its hep C action plan and the integration of hepatitis C into the framework of 2011 to 15 and accompanied, of course, by the investment essential to achieving the goals of that framework. Since the Hep C Action Plan was published in 2006, the number of actual diagnoses, of annual diagnoses, I should say, has increased by a quarter. More than 6,000 people have been started on treatment, and 45 million pieces of clean injection equipment have been distributed. However, despite this significant progress, recent treatment targets haven't been met, and further action is needed, otherwise Hep C will remain as a significant public health concern, resulting in higher, higher rates of liver disease and cancer at great cost to the NHS in Scotland. In last week's 2020 Vision for the NHS debate, the Cabinet Secretary for Health said she was looking to plan for the NHS well beyond 2020 and would welcome positive suggestions. I would therefore put forward for consideration the target suggested by the Hep Hepatitis C Trust of eliminating Hep C in Scotland by 2030. 
This is a reasonable target, given the increasing availability of new drug treatments being approved by the SNMC, which particularly when used in combination, are highly effective in eliminating the virus. So my plea to government would be for it to consider giving its commitment to a strategy for the elimination of Hep C, which aims to reduce the incidence of new cases to zero, to raise public awareness of the virus, with a particular but not exclusive focus on injecting drug users, to diagnose all those living with Hep C, and to endeavour to ensure that everyone diagnosed as being infected with the virus will have prompt access to the treatments which are most appropriate for them and full support throughout their treatment. Presiding officer, the SMC has already approved a number of new drugs for the treatment of Hep C, and more are in the pipeline. And I would be interested to hear from the Minister in her response to the debate if these new treatments will qualify for the new medicines fund currently in place and hopefully, hopefully to be extended beyond 2016, depending, of course, on available funding and political will. So if the excellent work of recent years is built on and cooperation continues, as suggested in the motion between the Scottish Government, the NHS, the third sector and pharmaceutical companies, then I have no doubt the elimination of Hep C as a serious public health concern in Scotland can be achieved in the foreseeable future. And once again, I commend Kevin Stewart for securing time for this important debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And perhaps at the outset, since the motion refers to pharmaceutical companies, I declare that my nephew Joe works for one, albeit she lives in Sweden, but then it's an international industry. Um, it, it's really quite interesting, statistically, um, that we're told that there may be up to or approaching 40,000 people in Scotland with chronic uh, infection uh, from Hep C. Well, statistically, that means that one member of this parliament has Hep C. Now, we recognise that there is a social discrimination and we are perhaps not the most likely cohort of people to suffer from it. But it gives a context and a perspective uh, to the spread of this particular uh, disease. And, of course, we can be exposed to this disease not simply because we've uh, been sharing needles in... Uh, the use of drugs, uh, but through our use of blood products. And I myself, uh, some 30 plus years ago, I was injected with gamma globulin precisely because I was traveling to areas where there were a wide range of infections that uh, might attack my immune system. And it was thought proper uh, to boost it before I went there. Um, that has meant that uh, my blood donating uh, years came to an end about 15 years ago, and for many years I could only give my blood for plasma. Uh, so far, so good. I don't think there's any particular signs uh, that I have uh, that sort of infection. But then, one of the difficulties with uh, this particular virus is, of course, the difficulty in diagnosis, and uh, it, it can sit dormant and undiagnosed uh, for a very long time. And, of course, the liver is uh, one of the more difficult organs of the human body uh, to treat. 30 or 40 years ago, serious conditions of the liver essentially could not be treated. Palliative care uh, would be given. Um, it was often the third cause of death in car accidents and when people's livers were ruptured because basically they bled to death. You could pack it, but it didn't really do very much good because the liver uh, didn't uh, heal itself uh, very effectively. But today, we're in a different position. We have got the possibility of liver transplants. We have a relatively wide range of pharmacological interventions uh, with varying degrees of success. And it's a tribute to the pharmacological companies and the support that the NHS has given to people suffering from hep C that we see people who recover, from, for whom the virus is eliminated from the system uh, and who are restored to good health. Uh, and in that basis, I, I hope that we see uh, much more of that in future. Now, with uh, the pancreas and the liver, we've got two organs of the body uh, that can cause great difficulties. Um, viruses, we increasingly learn how to deal with. Uh, hopefully, uh, we get on to dealing with prions, the cause of CJD, which is, of course, why I was stopped uh, being allowed to, to, to give blood. I congratulate uh, Kevin Stewart on uh, 
uh, bringing forward this excellent debate. It's timely, it's uh, informative. I've going, I'm certainly going away having learned uh, a great deal from the contributions of people here. And of course, I congratulate the trust that looks after and supports people who suffer from Hep C, because when you have these conditions that are both very highly variable uh, and often relatively invisible over long periods of time, but also carrying with them a degree of social stigma, having that kind of support is of immense value to people who suffer from it. And I hope they continue uh, to provide that kind of support for many years to come but I hope even more we eliminate the disease and their efforts become entirely unnecessary. Presiding officer. Many thanks. And I now call Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate uh, Kevin Stewart on securing this very important debate. Um, I think we all recognise the importance of the debate and the issue of how properly we support people who are affected by hepatitis C. And I was particularly struck by his comments reading out people's stories about the extent to which actually health is not just about drugs, but it's about how you can share with others who are facing the same challenges. And I hope in whatever debates we have, we ensure that support for people goes beyond simply ensuring they have the right drugs, but we allow them the space to address the, the challenges that they face with whatever their condition is. And I was interested to learn about the medical advances and the funding challenges of tackling hepatitis C. And it's good to see progress, it is good to see work being built on from the past and, and taken forward now. And it's not often that I would say this in here, but I did feel there was a sense of optimism in uh, particularly Kevin Stewart's own contribution about the, the sense in which people are pulling in the right direction and making a difference. But I do think it is inevitable, as uh, perhaps Malcolm and others have reflected, that we also think about the impact of the use of contaminated blood and the consequences for those who then contracted hepatitis C and other conditions as a consequence of that. We know how important it is to tackle this disease, but I trust the Deputy Presiding Officer will permit me to add some thoughts specifically on the issue of contaminated blood. As one of the many helpful briefings that we received in this debate says, quote, anyone who looks dispassionately at the issue feels that the state has a moral duty to the infected. And as someone who was in the first parliament elected in 1999, this is, of course, an issue that has been politically live since the Scottish Parliament itself opened. And a lot of time and energy has been used in addressing this challenge. But for too many of those affected, it feels there's still insufficient progress has been made. And everyone here will know of those who are still actively campaigning on these issues. And the reality is that still many questions are, um, and significant issues remain Unresolved. I was struck a recent presentation, I think hosted by Richard Lyle in the Parliament, with a very powerful presentation by those who were campaigning on the question of the impact of contaminated blood on people's lives. We could be in no mistake the degree to which anger and passion still remain there, determined to have these questions addressed. But even more powerful for me was the direct meeting I had with a constituent of mine who wanted to talk about the impact on her and her family of losing a family member, a loved one, uh, as a consequence of his having contracted hepatitis C. He was a haemophiliac and as a child was given uh, contaminated blood. And I want to take this opportunity to share my constituents' thoughts, giving voice to a desire which I think not just she has, but others to make sure that the really significant questions are answered. My constituent outlined the reality, and we've heard or mentioned already, of the stigma associated with being uh, found to have hepatitis C or HIV for that matter in the 80s and 90s. And I know that we have made huge progress, but still more has to be done. But at that time, the consequence was that her loved one could not share with a broader family or with friends the truth of his condition. They couldn't speak to anybody else, and inevitably the pressure on them as a couple became immense. The person suffering was silenced and the immediate family could not take or share their anxieties or fears with anyone else. I think that therefore recognised wasn't just a physical condition, but there was emotional distress that came with that too, which lived out as long as the person lived. Anger at not getting action, but also a sense potentially of giving somebody the guilt of being the parent who had sanctioned the transfusion 
in the first place. These are all issues, I think, that are immensely powerful um, in people's lives as a consequence. And now, of course, huge hope and expectation on the Penrose inquiry. And we know, and it's been highlighted already, the significance of the question of compensation. And that's absolutely right and understandable. But for my constituent, more than anything, they want answers about how could this have happened at all and whether, even when problems were recognised, did the system continue to be reckless with a consequence for very many people. So I ask the Minister in conclusion, in relation specifically to Penrose reporting, how will families be briefed on its findings? What will the Scottish Government do to ensure that they know very quickly what those recommendations are? What will be the timescale for implementing recommendations? How will the compensation issues be pursued? And centrally, I hope she can give, the Minister can give reassurance that the Government at the most central case address most centrally the case of anger that the state must have a responsibility to those who suffered so grievously and for so many people who still continue to live with the condition or to live with the pain of having lost somebody in these circumstances. And I hope that I'm sure across the chamber we want to see massive progress in addressing the whole question of hepatitis C, but in particular that the findings of Penrose come as a comfort to those who have been campaigning for so long. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can I now invite Maureen Watt to respond to the debate, Minister, in around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to provide closing remarks to this debate. It's been a very interesting discussion, and I'm pleased that all of us recognise the importance of this issue, and to all those members who spoke and gave uh, individual uh, case studies and, and people that they knew who suffered from hep C, I think, actually brings it to life and shows um, that the personal stories bring this, the, the real problems faced and the stark realities faced by those suffering from hep C. Can I just deal uh, with Joanne Lamont's questions? I am not going to get into the whole Penrose inquiry uh, in this member's debate. That is obviously for another day when the uh, inquiry is published. I am sure it will be brought to the floor of this chamber and dealt with specifically uh, in that. Um, this is a very significant time, as many have mentioned, for hep C. Um, and nowhere else in the world can say it is in any better position than Scotland to take advantage of recent developments. And it might be useful to say a few words briefly of what we've done in Scotland. Others have mentioned the work uh, begun in the first and second parliaments uh, and what recognised Malcolm's work. And a lot of what we do now is down to the Hep C Phase 2 Action Plan, which was launched in 2008. And as a result of that action plan, we have more than doubled the number of people who commence treatment every year and have significantly improved access to testing and care services. And as some people have mentioned, it needs to be a very holistic approach. Importantly, we have also continued to invest in prevention services, including injecting equipment provision. This is critically important because treatment can't stand alone. And if we are to have the best public health impact, we need to invest in prevention. And this we did. And because of this investment, we have seen a real reduction in the number of new hep C infections <coughs> in injecting young uh, drug users. We've also seen a real change in the epidemic curve and a reduction in the number of people infected in Scotland. These results speak for themselves, and they have done so in international scientific literature and in public policy discussions. And Scotland is now rightly seen as a world leader in this area. Our action plan has been described by the, by the World Hepatitis Alliance as a model of good practice. Scottish leaders have presented on the action plan at the European Commission in Brussels, at the World Health Assembly in Geneva, and at the White House in the United States. More recently, the Scottish Government has supported the World Health Organization in the development of its global hepatitis programme. So Scotland really is leading the world, and we should uh, celebrate that. The Hep C Action Plan, as some have mentioned, came to an end in 2011, but hepatitis continued to be a priority for this government, and this was reflected 
in the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Framework, which was published in 2011. All government investment in support for hepatitis C was maintained under this new policy. That framework has been a great opportunity to bring together viral hepatitis, HIV and sexual health and to develop a more holistic approach to prevention, treatment and care. It also maintains a strong focus on the needs of the patient, something I'll say a bit more about, but while recognising the importance of the relevant cross-cutting policies. As others have mentioned, the framework comes to a conclusion this year, and this gives us an excellent opportunity to build on the strengths of the policy over the last five years, while taking into account of how the landscape has changed since 2011, how we have progressed towards delivering our out outcomes, and what current ep epidemiology tells us. We will publish a refreshed framework later this year, and work has already commenced on that. Hep C will continue to be a key priority. Indeed, I chaired a meeting of the National Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Advisory Committee just last week, where there was a good, very good discussion about the future of hepatitis C policy. The discussion at that group related to the work of the treatment and therapies subgroup. This is an expert group my predecessor established to provide advice to government on priorities in the light of the new therapies now becoming available. That group will report back to the National Advisory Committee in the coming months, and we will ensure that the advice is taken into account of when drafting um, the new framework. It will take into account um, that there are new drugs, much better drugs, um, and uh, we will use that, obviously, in taking forward where we go from here. A key point to make is that the expert group includes representation from patient groups. If there is one thing that sets the Scottish Government approach apart from other strategies elsewhere in the world, it is that we act, act, engage proactively with our patient groups. We did this through the development of the action plan and the framework, and we're doing it now as we think of the opportunities and challenges of the new treatments. So we very much take the view that we work in partnership with the NHS and the third sector, but also very much with patients themselves. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the Scottish Government continues to be ambitious for Scotland. We are world readers in this area, something we're very keen to remain. Whilst at times this may mean making difficult decisions, we will continue to work with patients and professionals. We want to now be using the language of elimination and eradication when we talk about Hep C in Scotland. A few years ago, that would have been an impossibility. It is now a very realistic ambition, and I'm happy to drive that forward. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes Kevin Stewart's debate on hepatitis C, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.